Professor Abba Brown, and the course is Confronting Oppression and Injustice. So we've been talking a lot about the empowerment, empowerment theories and the empowerment approach. So I just wanted to cover a couple of things that are relevant to the empowerment approach related to you as the practitioner. The empowerment approach requires practitioner self-awareness. So there's a number of questions that it's important for an anti-oppressive practitioner to ask themselves related to empowerment. Remember that empowerment is both process and product. It is impossible to facilitate empowerment for others if you do not undergo the process yourself. And empowerment is also an ongoing process. It is not just an a one-time thing that you do and then you're empowered. It is something that is ongoing and so it is important that empowerment and the self-awareness is integrated into the praxis that an anti-oppressive practitioner engages in. So the self-awareness required really speaks to understanding your own individual power. What groups you as a practitioner belong to, how you understand your relationship to the environment, the limitations you identify on your power, identification of ways that you as a practitioner may be oppressed, identification of ways that you contribute to oppression or maintaining and enforcing oppressive practices, and then also understanding how to attain more power. On an individual level, it's important to recognize and inquire about these things for a sense of personal empowerment. On a professional level, it is our ethical imperative to understand the ways in which we might be impacted by oppression in order to facilitate empowerment in an unbiased manner for the clients and constituents that we might serve. So the empowerment approach requires practitioner self-awareness. Second, the empowerment approach is dependent upon skill utilization. The more skillful we are at establishing rapport, asking questions, reflecting hypotheses, challenging, all skills that are fundamental to the practice of social work, if those skills are well-tuned, empowerment and facilitating empowerment for your clients is easier. Empowerment is really embedded in these social work skills and our ability to perfect those skills so that they are natural, that they are value neutral, and that they recognize bias when there is bias to be recognized. Additionally, the empowerment approach utilizes the collective. If you remember, collective experience often precipitates collective action. And so in the empowerment approach to social work, social work practice, for any group that we are trying to empower, it is critical for the social work practitioner to create spaces where groups of people can share their experiences. We know that the sharing of those experiences often thematically provides a good foundation of understanding for each individual that has either endured and survived an experience and also for the practitioner to understand the perspective that this particular type of oppression um, is being viewed at through this collective experience. Based on that collective experience, oftentimes groups of people will be moved to collective action, whether that is revitalizing a neighborhood, whether it is voting, whether it is organizing a social campaign or a political campaign, or whether it is supporting somebody who is running for office. Oftentimes, however, in empowerment, we find that collective experience precipitates collective action, and collective action is often met with resistance. It would be unwise for an anti-oppressive practitioner to believe that through the facilitation of collective experience and the support of collective action that change will be made. It is wiser for a practitioner to understand that any time a group of people is moved to collective action, there will be resistance to that group of people. Our ability to articulate the systemic oppression that has impacted this group of people and articulate the change strategies that we feel will ameliorate this oppression are critical to have before we move into collective action so that there is a response to the resistance that comes out as a result of collective action. 
our ability to articulate these things and to make the case for change are critical to have solid before we engage in collective action in order to be able to respond effectively to resistance and to continue beyond resistance to change. And the empowerment approach engage, engages metacognition. Metacognition is loosely defined as thinking about what we think about. Oftentimes in social work, I call this our social work spidey senses. The tingling feeling you have when something is wrong, the ways in which you can overhear a conversation between two people and know that they are miscommunicating with one another or misunderstanding one another and intuitively want to insert yourself into the conversation to clear up the misunderstanding. Oftentimes, this sense of intuition, this personality, these personality traits often lead us into the practice of social work. It is, like I've mentioned before, a practice of both art and science. And in many ways, social work is very organic to the practitioner's experience or their style of social work. So the metacognition that I refer to is being able as a social work practitioner to think about what you are thinking about as you are engaged with clients. Recognizing your own biases, understanding limitations that a group might experience, and also identifying themes that you find from the collective which can be used as strengths, which can be used as building blocks for a plan of action. So the empowerment approach requires that the social work practitioner think about what is happening, how things are occurring, how oppression is impacting a group of people, while also listening to the group of people and engaging in the skill-based relationships that we need to have with those individuals to facilitate empowerment.